more gear talk in this video with a look at some famous, uh, sometimes infamous, guitars from the punk, the alt, the post-punk realm. I'm Darren, uh, this is Deceleny, and here are 12 players with 12 guitars that are all a little out of the ordinary in one way or another. And really, considering uh, rock and roll was meant to epitomise, to embody the idea of wild, youthful, noisy rebellion, uh, guitarists on the whole can be creatures of habit. Yeah, quite traditional in many ways, leaning into the popular instrument choices of the day, often consciously you know, aping their heroes or contemporaries. Uh, flavours have come in waves over the years, but they often tend to crystallise around you know, the classics, uh, the Strat, the Tele, the Les Paul. And occasionally, you know, a band, a sound, a look will come along and something different will get a look in. The Beatles and their Rickenbackers, uh, the metal bands of the 1980s and those pointy shreddy guitars of that period, uh, shoegazers and you know, indie rockers with the Fender offsets like the Jazzmaster and the Jaguar. Uh, this list, however, is looking at the oddballs, the one-offs and the messed up examples uh, that resonated with certain guitarists. And first up, a multiple guitar entry, actually. Uh, this is John Rice of uh, Rocket from the Crypt, Drive Like Jehu, Hot Snakes, many others, and his customised Gibson Les Pauls. The Les Paul is a classic heavy rock guitar, yes, but uh, John's mods uh, take it into some pretty weird directions, thanks to a rather cavalier <laughs> attitude to tradition. Yeah, John has three readily identifiable Les Pauls, all of them kind of mauled and tinkered with, uh, to varying degrees. Yeah, the Dragon and the Black ones have both been treated to extensive uh, weight relief. Um, Les Pauls were traditionally quite heavy, uh, usually mahogany bodied, and John's weight relief goes at it in the most brutal way imaginable. Yeah, the Black one has some kind of perspex uh, modesty <laughs> screens uh, covering the damage on the back. And both have some very odd neck pickup choices for a Les Paul. Uh, the Dragon has an old uh, diamond gold foil, and uh, the black one, the Les Paul Pro, has a lipstick pickup from an old uh, Dan Electro bass. Uh, both of these pickups are very bright, very present, uh, slightly compressed sounding. And crucially for all these guitars, each pickup gets its own output jack and is fed to a separate amp on stage. And I think this is the crucial element to, you know, that, you know, pile driving kind of layered sound of John's. You know, it, you get the thickness of a humbucker or a P90 in the bridge blending in the room uh, with the kind of the sharp, the more cutting edge of, you know, those non-standard neck pickups. Yeah, and it's that doing it in the room, feeding them to different amplifiers. This is what allows you to tweak and tailor that sound perfectly. No bleeding through from one to the other. Yeah, it is a phenomenal sound. Yeah, John's other uh, much modded Les Paul uh, has a sparkle top uh, and this also, you know, has that split output arrangement. But in this case, it's that big black EMG aftermarket humbucker in the bridge that, that is the interesting thing. This is the source of that, you know, screeching kind of bird noise feedback effect that you hear on tracks like uh, Drive Like Jehu's Luau and Golden Brown. Yeah, there's something in the magnetic field that that pickup generates that just doesn't get along with the transformers in uh, John's Marshall JCM amplifier. And it generates this unique kind of signature feedback noise, which uh, John just incorporates into the music. Yeah, this is one of those cases where, you know, a happy accident just happens to, you know, result in something that sounds uh, incredibly cool. Yeah, anyway, John's a tinkerer. He's probably changed these pickups already by the time I've published this video. Um, them's the vagaries. Uh, two, I've got uh, Lee Ronaldo of Sonic Youth with the uh, pickup behind the bridge, Jazzmaster. Uh, and yeah, it's pointless trying to generate a hierarchy of the most significant Sonic Youth guitars uh, due to Lee and Thurston's, you know, bewildering number of guitars that they have dedicated to specific songs and specific tunings. Yeah, one of note would be uh, the Drifter, as it was called, uh, which is a knackered old cheap Les Paul copy that had its frets ripped out sometime in the 80s and, and was usually played uh, with drumsticks wedged under the strings, uh, usually only four of those strings. And, you know, yeah, it's just plastered with duct tape and stickers. Yeah, certainly an iconic Sonic Youth guitar. Here's a photo of me in my youth, circa 1990 or 91, uh, wearing a cheap bootleg Sonic Youth t-shirt with the Drifter on it. Now, I think most people associate Sonic Youth with all those jazz masters, dozens of them, 
um, many of which were stolen uh, in uh, 1999, necessitating you know, a wholesale uh, refresh, a restock of the Sonic Youth guitar stable. Uh, but I'm digressing. Uh, the, the one guitar of interest that I've singled out here is one of Lee's, uh, and it features a pickup added behind the guitar's bridge, uh, there to pick up those sympathetic clanks and clangs and harmonics. Yeah, this one does feature uh, on video. If you check out the Cool Thing video uh, from the Goo album, uh, you should be able to see it there. Yeah, no traditional uh, bridge pickup, a, a humbucker at the neck, uh, and it's relatively unmolested uh, beyond that. But this behind the bridge thing, it's an interesting concept and one which plays very much into that Sonic Youth mindset you know, of capturing dissonant, off-key, extraneous noise, you know, to pile into that stew of, you know, gnarly, clashing guitars that Lee and Thurston and Kim were, you know, cooking up. Uh, third up, and I have uh, Pete Shelley of the Buzzcocks and the Starway guitar. And uh, you could argue, uh, and I'm going to, <laughs> that this humble little guitar, yeah, you know, the top half missing, is one of the most important guitars of late 20th century musical history. Uh, Pete bought this from a shop in his hometown of Lee uh, in about 1972 or thereabouts. It was basically his, you know, teenage electric. He'd been playing for a year or two. And yeah, it's just a simple Starway branded single pickup electric guitar made by Tysco. And a few years on after answering an ad from Howard DeVoto on his college notice board, um, it was the very same guitar that he took into the Buzzcocks and which he used during the recording of their Spiral Scratch EP in December of 1976. A pivotal EP. This is often cited as the first of the DIY self-released independent records of the punk era and the inspiration for the entire punk, post-punk indie scene that would follow. Yeah, it is a landmark record really and uh, Pete Starway actually gets a name check on the sleeve. Uh, and the damage to it, yeah, apparently Pete threw it down uh, in a frenzy during a heated rehearsal and uh, the top half, the top bout, it just sheared off in a single piece. Yeah, a bit bemused, a bit disappointed probably, uh, he picked it up uh, only to find that it was still fine and playing in tune and a little bit lighter and easier to handle actually, so uh, it just stayed. Yeah, in recent years Eastwood Guitars have made a signature reissue of this. Um, it came out just a few years before Pete's death uh, in very limited numbers. Um, but signed, uh, and they all come with this really dinky custom-made case, which is designed to fit it in its kind of sawn-off uh, state. Yeah, for a broken, uh, cheap, Far Eastern-built guitar with very little to recommend it, um, from all the other starter guitars of the 1970s, Pete Starway has managed to secure, I think, a little corner in the history of indie music uh, that I'm sure no one could have ever predicted. At uh, number four, I've got uh, John Spencer of Pussy Glow, Boss Hog and the John Spencer Blues Explosion and his Zimgar guitar. Another uh, Tysco product like the Starway, uh, this one being the Zimgar branded guitar that was picked up from a pawn shop by John's wife. Uh, and this would be the instrument that he would use throughout his time with the John Spencer Blues Explosion. And uh, John's Zimgar has this uniquely scuzzy sound, which seems to be purely a factor of, you know, manufacturing inconsistencies in the original guitars, uh, specifically in this case, the pickups. It seems to be the case that no two guitars of the same brand will ever sound quite the same. And the Zimgar uh, soaks up, you know, you know, nasty fuzz sounds like a sponge and spits out something you know, even nastier uh, at the other end. Judah Bauer, the second guitarist in the Blues Explosion, has often remarked how difficult it is to accompany John uh, on his Zimgar. Yeah, the intonation on the Zimgar is all over the place, meaning that Judah often had to bend his strings to kind of try and meet somewhere up with John's pitch. This is definitely one of those guitars that kind of fights back and requires a certain playing style uh, to beat it into submission. And uh, yeah, I think it might have met its match in John. A uh, change of direction with the next handful of entries. Uh, these are all about uh, custom built guitars, which all somehow bear the imprint of the players that wield them. No accidents, no hacks, no experiments with these. Uh, these are all exactly what these guitarists wanted. And I think they say a little bit about the style, the taste, uh, often the philosophy uh, of their owners. Uh, five, I've got Andy Gill of Gang of Four and his No Neck Pickup Strats. So around about 1980, 82, circa the Solid Gold, uh, Songs of the Free albums, Andy was regularly spotted playing one of a pair of Johnston custom Strat copies. Yeah, one was black, one was kind of bronzy coloured, both hardtail, no tremolo, and crucially, only two pickups, uh, the middle and the bridge, no neck pickup there at all. 
Yeah, these can be very clearly seen on the old grey whistle test performances of this period. Uh, not much in the way of interviews with Andy uh, at this time to shed too much light on, on these choices, but I think knowing Andy's style and sound, um, there are a few things we can probably guess at. Uh, so firstly, uh, and most obviously, yeah, he didn't play the neck pickup, so he had it removed. This is a good thing. Often pickups, as well as picking up the vibrations, they can also um, inhibit string movement. You know, I, they, they can kind of choke off the natural sustain, the vibration, the decay of those strings. Uh, and given Andy's sound at this time, you know, that screed, the piercing feedback, sustaining notes, um, removing that neck pickup makes even more sense. Uh, secondly, another thing, yeah, playing that kind of tight, controlled, clicky, funky staccato stuff, um, there's very little need for a tremolo, um, the springs of which would also affect the sustain and the decay of those vibrating strings. Thinking about it, these, these two pickup strats, they play directly to Andy's strengths and his needs, the precision and the sustain and the control of feedback. Uh, why both of these guitars effectively disappeared from sight after this, I, I guess we'll never really know. But I think the slightly more commercial, the kind of slightly poppier funk direction of hard was just around the corner. And, you know, um, I think a white bread kind of strat was the de rigueur instrument for that, you know, classic 80s studio funk sound. So at six, I've got uh, Johnny Marr of The Smiths and the Roger Giffen Green Telecaster. A bit of a quickie here, uh, you know, Ma may have been synonymous with, you know, 80s jangle, you know, Rickenbackers, the occasional S335, uh, much more recently, you know, his own custom signature Fender Jaguar. But in the studio, all bets were off. Yeah, a promo piece, the circa the recording of the Meat Is Murder album in 1985, originally aired again on the Whistle Test on BBC Two, uh, shows Ma playing this very distinctive green burst custom Telecaster. Um, that certain fans have obsessed over ever since. What do we know? It was made by Roger Giffen. Uh, it was very, very heavy. It was either solid maple or maple capped mahogany. It's covered in a ton of brass hardware, including the pick guard, and it has a humbucker at the neck. Yeah, this was just an iconic bit of Johnny Marr folklore, really, and a very distinctive looking telly. And that bright, clean telly sound uh, through a jazz chorus, uh, yeah, it could often deputize for a Rickenbacker. Apparently he still has uh, Greeny, <laughs> And it does make the odd public appearance still, but you know, it's the heft, the weight of it that really limits its usefulness for live stuff. Uh, and that's that. Okay, the last entry in this kind of little mini custom section. And after Johnny Ma, a very nearly rhyming rocker who is probably the complete sonic antithesis of everything that the Smiths ever stood for. From Johnny Ma, we go to at number seven on this list, John Moore of Tar and his aluminium Tar guitar. Yeah, an imposing, fearsome, uh, telly-shaped instrument that visually caught, you know, the dark, industrial-tinged punk vibe of Chicagoans' tar uh, perfectly. In fact, it featured on the cover of the band's 1993 Clincher EP, uh, leaving the viewer in uh, no doubt about what they could expect to hear on queuing up this record. And this represents a kind of inverse take on what would come to be the accepted form of the aluminium guitar. Most of these, you know, the Travis Beans, the Valenos, the Kramers, the Vaccaros, the ECGs, they all sport an aluminium neck and fretboard often um, with a wooden body. John's instrument, however, features a traditional wooden neck and fretboard attached to a hollow aluminium body. And John primarily commissioned this to make a durable guitar, first and foremost. So Ian Schneller, a Chicago-based luthier of uh, Specimen, uh, he suggested aluminium John provided the lipstick pickup from an old silver tone, and this is the result. And Tar, a killer band with a killer sound and, uh, and an aesthetic. Uh, this guitar, alongside the matching bass that shortly followed, came to define many listeners' lasting impression of Tar's music. This tough, utilitarian, gritty, mechanised thing. Yeah, to me, this represents a true meeting of engineering and artistry and attitude. And uh, yeah, it's a very... Cool guitar indeed. So for this last run of players, we've got five examples of uh, off-the-peg guitars, which have become virtually synonymous with their users. But these are the weird, the rare, the sometimes idiosyncratic instruments which have found a home in these guys' hands. At eight, I've got uh, Dave Fielding of The Chameleons and his Microfrets Swinger. Microfrets, one of the weirdest US 
guitar companies to emerge in the late 60s. Um, their instruments are pure cult. Uh, only a few thousand were made between uh, 1967 and the company's dissolution in 1975. And Dave Fielding of The Chameleons is probably, in my opinion, uh, their most famous champion. Yeah, he used their Swinger model almost exclusively and his playing is a core part of the band sound through their golden period, I guess you'd say, from 81 through to about 86, from Scrooge to the Bridge through to Strange Times. Uh, tonally, the Swinger sits somewhere between the kind of the bright chime of a Rickenbacker and that kind of full range depth of a jazz master. It's a great foundation for all that swirling effect. And the Chameleons, yeah, great band melding, post-punk textures with huge atmospheric soundscapes, kissing cousins, I think, to the Bunny Men, and an obvious precursor to the subsequent shoegaze, dream pop bands. They, they just never really seemed to get the breaks and, you know, couldn't maintain that early momentum of theirs. As for microfrets, they have started making guitars again over the last five years or so. So uh, yeah, go check them out. They're very interesting. At nine, I've got Pete Kemba, a.k.a. Sonic Boom of uh, Spaceman 3, Spectrum, his solo work, and the Vox Starstream. Yeah, Vox have always been more heralded for their amps, you know, the AC30, AC15, uh, and their FX, some of the wahs, some of their fuzzes. But their instruments of the mid to late 60s do have their fans too. I think Ian Curtis playing a Vox Phantom late on in the Joy Division run. Uh, he's playing one in the Love Will Tear Us Apart video. Um, and Will Sargent, he, he made great use of their 12-string teardrop model. Um, yeah, it's the Killing Moon guitar. Uh, but in the oddball stakes, uh, the also uh, teardrop-shaped Starstream model is pretty hard to beat. And this is the one which uh, Pete Kemba used to great effect on the later of the Spaceman 3 albums. Yeah, onboard effects. It came with an inbuilt fuzz, a booster, this weird palm wah. And um, yeah. I think if we're talking Spaceman 3, though, the, the thing that really stands out is the onboard repeat percussion tremolo. This is a weird tremolo, a very unique stuttery waveform, um, crazily abrupt choppy sounds that were pretty much unique to this Vox specific circuit. Yeah, and the weirdly kind of synth like texture this, this type of tremolo uh, imparts to any signal it gets its hands on, it, it kind of prefigures the direction that Sonic would end up taking in his post spacemen guys i guess you'd say you know ultimately falling for analog modular synthesis in a very big way so moving on into the early 80s for the final three here which in a way feels like to me the last decade when you know guitar companies were genuinely prepared to try something new yeah the 90s saw the advent of the kind of full-scale reissue mindset you know when the big names fender and gibson they decided that it was far safer uh more lucrative to just you know replay the tried and tested hits cheaper takes on old 50s and 60s designs you know an upmarket custom shop for the uh, properly minted and basically you're just a low risk bet on the tastes of the average guitar fan yeah i do honestly struggle to think of a genuinely new guitar design which has emerged in the last 30 years or so that actually found an audience uh, the Parker Fly, um, yeah, that never really took off, did it? Yeah, maybe they had a point. Anyway, first up, uh, uh, the last uh, guitar venture for one of the OGs, I guess, of the modern electric guitar as we know it. Yeah, that would be Leo Fender. And at 10 on my list, I've got Robert Poss of Band of Susans and the GNL SC1. Yeah, GNL stands for George and Leo. That's George Fullerton and Leo Fender. And they started producing guitars in about 1980. Uh, the SC series, the SC1, the SC2, and the 3 were amongst the earliest models, you know, debuting in about 1982-83. Yeah, and although these guitars represented the evolution of what Leo Fender's idea of, you know, the mass-produced, you know, quality electric guitar should be, by the mid-80s, um, they'd been produced in very few numbers, they hadn't been a big hit, and it was at this point that they came to the attention of Robert Potts. He could pick them up cheaply in pawn shops for 150, 200 bucks. And the SC1 in particular was this dead simple ergonomic single pickup design. Very solid, very easy to play, easy to work on and maintain. Uh, yeah, a very good buy for not a lot of money. And crucially, they came loaded with Leo's last great innovation. That's the MFD, the Magnetic Field Design Pickup. Uh, an evolution of his original single pickup concept, but just better, uh, clearer. Uh, more balanced, more adjustment, a better pickup. 
yeah, the clarity, the power and the sustain of these simple single pickup guitars were the perfect match for the kind of the, the multi guitar stacked interlocking compositional style that Poss was perfecting in his group Band of Susans. Yeah, Robert described the sound of these pickups as having neutrality with character and hi-fi, but not clinical. And Band of Seasons became so associated with these guitars that um, the whole band ended up using them, all modified with kind of the addition of this self-designed uh, pick guard to give them a different look, a kind of Les Paul Jr. vibe that, like Tar earlier, the aesthetic just, just, just jived so well with what they were doing sonically that the guitars became the stars. Uh, featuring on the artwork of several Band of Seasons records, here's uh, the cover of their The Word and the Flesh album, featuring one of the SC1s. And it was this elevation of the SC1 to you know, a work of art that brought Band of Seasons to the attention of g &L, uh, of Leo himself. And the band were invited uh, along for a day at the g &L factory where they met Leo in person. As Robert put it, you know, it, it was like an audience with the creator himself. Uh, moving on uh, to number 11, I've got Billy Bragg and the Burns Steer. The Steer is an early 80s design that was uh, initially produced by Burns in tiny numbers, maybe as few as 30, uh, according uh, to some sources, shortly before the company effectively, you know, collapsed in 1983. Uh, and this guitar, the iconic Billy Bragg Burns Steer, is, according to Bragg himself, the only one of that run that was finished in what is now considered, you know, the classic green burst finish. And this is the sound of classic brag. It's all over the Talking with the Taxman LP. So, you know, that brash, choppy, edgy clang you hear on tracks like Levi Stubbs Tears. Uh, it's all steer. And no, it is not an acoustic at all. The sound hole is essentially a fake. It's just a shallow recess to trick the eye. Uh, but the guitar itself is chambered to keep the weight down. Interestingly, that metal plate where the pickups are mounted serves as a pick guard and an integrated bridge all in one with a raised lip at the back for mounting the strings. Yeah, the Burns brand was uh, resuscitated in the mid to late 90s and a modified version of the steer with a few kind of rough edges cut off uh, has been a part of that line since the turn of the millennium. OK, the final entry on this list and quite possibly the peak of 80s guitar design weirdness. At 12, I've got Mick Jones of uh, The Clash and Big Audio Dynamite with the Bond Electric Glide. Yeah, made in Scotland for only a few years, uh, a couple of thousand units tops were created uh, the Electroglide is one weird instrument. Yeah, it's carbon fibre throughout with a stepped aluminium fretboard that dispensed with frets altogether. Um, I think this might be the most radical guitar of the 80s. It had to be plugged into the mains to power its onboard controls uh, and its LED display. There were a few high profile guitarists tempted into using an Electroglide, uh, mostly due to the company's link with a music management company that had signed up some big acts of the time acts like U2, The Clash, uh, The Eurythmics. Uh, but to me, its most highly visible user was Mick Jones uh, in his post-Clash kind of melting pot band, uh, Big Audio Dynamite, BAD. And this band really doubled down on that kind of hodgepodge pick and mix element of The Clash's Sandinista, with elements of rap, reggae, dance, electronic music, uh, with always a rock backbone. Uh, their sound is very of its day. Um, much of it, I dare say, might appear a little cringe nowadays but a few of their very best numbers equals mc squared um the bottom line they hold up and um crucially the electric light is given pride of place in the promo videos for these singles yeah i think this is probably the high point or the low point depending on your view of 80s guitar technology and innovation um you know the failure of the electric light was kind of a portent if you like of the direction that guitar culture would take in the coming decade you know, give people what they already know, do cheaper versions for the kids, sell them at a premium to all the blues fanatics with a vacant wall, just waiting to hang their, you know, their pretty custom shop recreation on. <laughs> Cynic, moi, <laughs> au contraire. And there you go, that's the end. A dozen to put your fuzz in. Now that doesn't really work, does it? Um. Anyway, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this list. Uh, I would really love to hear um, some of your suggestions for oddball, weird, offbeat guitars um, that you think are worthy for inclusion in a list like this. As ever, if you've enjoyed this video, uh, please think about giving it a like. Uh, it really helps kind of uh, hurry things along here with regards to the channel. And um, 
yeah, I, always happy to see some new subscribers join the team. And that's it for this video. Uh, in the meantime, take care. Um, I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.